There, there it is. What is up, Lab Coat Agents, Dan? Peace out, brother. We'll, we'll see you on the, uh, behind the curtains. Lab Coat Agents, we are back for another daytime webinar. And uh, this is going to be an interesting one because it's a little bit different than typical topics that we talk about. Uh, and you've probably seen the uh, title of this webinar, which is Take Your Events to the Next Level. So we thought there's no better person to bring on than the AV company and person who we deal with, with our events. And let me preface this by saying this webinar is not just for like big time brokers or big time team leaders who are putting on big events that require audio visual equipment. Uh, what we actually want to talk about is how, you know, we're, we're progressing into a world, revolving into a world in real estate of influence, right? You want to grow your business. You need to be an influencer. You need to be somebody who is like has celebrity status. And what comes with that is also creating events that end up morphing and evolving into bigger events that might require a stage and might require sound and might require AV and, and all this fancy stuff to make your events really stand out uh, as an influencer. So we thought, who should we talk to about this? Well, that's pretty obvious. Doug Turner with Nomad Productions. Doug, welcome welcome to Lab Code Asian, my friend. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it, man. Dude, it is, San Diego was a blast working there at the Hotel Dell. Talk about a freaking premiere venue. Absolutely. So, so, to, so to give context, uh, Nomad Productions and Doug it came and did, he was the AV company and he ran the show for us behind the scenes in San Diego for LCA Live. So if you were there, uh, you tasted, you, you knew what that was about and what that entailed. And now it, we have since progressed to where they're going to be doing all of our one day events as well. And so we're excited about that. And uh, so Doug, before we get into the kind of the granular stuff and we get deep into the weeds on actual events and what agents need to know that most probably don't know about actually running an event, um, give us a little background on yourself and, and how it ties to real estate and what you do with events and that sort of fun stuff. Well, I appreciate it. Sure will, Jeff. I've um, been doing this about 20, 20 plus years. Uh, I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma, one stoplight, and it very rarely worked. A little young lady that... Uh, cut her teeth in Oklahoma by the name of Reba McIntyre. We grew up with her and her family. And uh, that's kind of how we kind of cut our teeth on this. And uh, I, my wife is actually a broker as well. She's been in the real estate business almost 20 years now and um, had the fortunate opportunity to get to work with several different companies, real estate coaching companies, personal self-development coaches, um, a lot of celebrity status as, as you, as you put it. And it's just grown. I mean, it was a small company back in the day and now we're, we're doing, oh, I can't even tell you, I think we have probably 15 shows on the books for this month, but we've got to work with people like Oprah, Stan Lee. Um, we've, been, we've been able to make some really neat relationships. Uh, we have several rigs on the road with different country music acts, and it's just been a lot of fun. Uh, but the, my favorite thing is taking someone from infancy stage, like you're talking about, and watching them grow. Because if you look at our warehouse, which is on the other side of that wall behind me, uh, it started off in the back of my pickup truck and I was doing a little bit of light work for uh, a few different groups and now it's grown into this. So when we talk about being an influencer, when we talk about, you know, starting small, this is an event that we're doing right here. I mean, we're broadcasting to hundreds of thousands of people. This is an event. And if you may, if you do the little details for the small events, when you do grow into the bigger events, it's going to be easier for you to understand how, how to take it on. Um, I got to brag a little bit. I was able to get an autographed hat from everybody on the team there in San Diego. So, and then this one right here is it's Nick and Nick and Tristan's signature. It doesn't look like much, but uh, this is uh, this is proud material. But uh, celebrities, there's a bunch of celebrities. That hat's worth uh, all of fifty cents, I think. <laughs> and a cup of coffee. But no, it's that's how it started. Um, I've done rooms for ten people. I've done rooms for fifty thousand people. Uh, but there again, a starting small, don't biting off more than you can chew. I've literally seen people try to go in and do an event for the first time and go in and rent a room and they're filing bankruptcy six months later because of the contracts they signed. So even if you do, the thing I do recommend it, y'all do an incredible job podcasting to your audience. Information is key. If you're trying to educate the end user or the end uh, receiver, that's everything about it. And you do that through production. You do that through your, you know, camera on your computer, through your audio mic. I'm wearing a little lavalier. 
um, you do that by the way you're doing it. And if they'll follow your steps, and I know you guys have come a long way from when we first started working together. There's a lot of copyright laws that'll, you know, have you ever, I had a realtor about six months ago, he spent three days doing a listing video. He was so excited and he brought it into our editing bay and our editors helped him edit it. It looked great. And he went to go put the music to it. And I asked him, I said, do you have the copyrights to this, this music? And he's like, no, do I need to do, do that? I said, I'm just telling you, I would probably look to ASCAP or CSAC before you spend all this time and money. Five minutes after uploading it to Facebook, they took it down. So we had to rebrand it with non-trademark, little things like that. And um, it, it could cost you more in the end. Uh, copyrights are the big thing right now. But what y'all are doing, man, is it's, it's awesome. And you're educating it. And let me, let me take it back a step first. So when we're talking events and I'm going to, and I can use myself as an example because I'm not, you know, I'm a part of lab code agents now, but um, a part of the reason I got to be a part of it, part of the reason I got to be an influencer was because of events. And, and we're talking, so we were talking to obviously the real estate community here. So whether, whether you're using an event as, a, as an opportunity to recruit. So, and, and we all know that anybody who's with the brokerages that do a lot of recruiting, you're, a lot of times you want to put on an event that is going to attract talent to your brokerage. Or, or for example, a lot of realtors will do uh, home buyer seminars, first time home buyer seminars. You might do an event at an apartment complex. Um, or you, know, you might actually put on an event exactly like I did, which was, hey, I brought LCA to St. Louis. And, and I was getting myself into an arena that I had never been in before. I had no idea what I was doing, but the, the, all I knew was I wanted to bring value to my real estate community to make myself stand out as someone who brings value to attract to my brand, to attract to my business. And it's all parallel. It all runs together. And, and honestly, you know, I, the way we did our event, we di it didn't require AV, uh, but it has since evolved into where now I see why AV is so important. And, and by AV, again, if you're just jumping on, we're talking about an audiovisual company, uh, somebody who, who comes in on a grander scale, like they, they set up concerts right? They set up stages and, and, and they mic people up and they have the screens and, and they do this, this big elaborate thing, but, but they do something as simple as a 50 person event. And I think, Doug, let's, let's start there. Let's start with, let's just say somebody uh, wants to put on an event that just isn't in your local hall uh, where there's no AV. Let's talk about what somebody could do when they're creating an event and what they could do, what you've seen and what they would need in order to do that. Number one, from an equipment standpoint, uh, and then number two, like the things they need to look out for like ASCAP, which I, that right there, you're talking right over my head. Right. Um, and so let's, let's get deeper sure. on that. So let's say you're going to put on a 50 person event and let's say you're going to do it at a community center. It's a government owned facility. The first step you need to do is before when you go in to, to meet with whoever your contact person is at the venue, you need to ask them a list of questions. You need to go in prepared. And I'll give you the list of questions that you guys can post up on the web. Y'all can um, you know, pass this along. The first thing is, is what are your guidelines for us having an event here? Like some, some allow alcohol, some don't. Some allow this, some don't. Some require that you have a security guard there. There's, there's a whole list of questions. You need to be prepared. And, and take time to read the agreement. Don't just, you know, don't don't just put it off to the side but let's say it's a let's say it's a small little convention center or a small little government-owned facility um the thing that you can do is you want to put one person you want to bring someone on you don't have to bring them on full-time just someone that will actually take the load off of you your job is out there to being in front so for example jeff we were back in the green room a lot together you were doing graphics i was coordinating the run of show i was micing people up I had a graphics person backstage and I had my audio guy at the front house mix. So when you're starting off small, that may be all one person, but let one person don't feel like you've got to control every step of the, of the movement. The reason why is it's going to free up your time to be able to talk with everybody in the room. It's like going to a wedding. We went to a wedding, my nephew's wedding in upstate New York last weekend. And their goal was to hit every one of the tables and thank everybody for coming to the wedding. So, but if you're trying to run everything backstage and you're trying to mic everybody, if you're trying to do it all, you're not going to get the FaceTime with your guests. So bring someone, bring an assistant on it and, and just let them help you and, and help them hold you accountable. And if anything goes wrong, I always tell people, if anything goes wrong, bring it on the, produ the production crew. 
you know, Mike's not working, now that production guy. We always take the blame for a lot of stuff and that's fine, but our job is to make you look professional and to put your best foot forward. And the more we work together, the more the trust factor goes up. So you know that that cue, that screen, that graphic is gonna be on the screen when you say that word. So even if you start small, let them go to the meetings and let them, it'll take a whole load of pressure off of you. I've been brought in on the middle, middle of a stream and they're like, what am I doing wrong? I go, first of all, you're trying to do it all. <coughs> Excuse me, you're trying to do this all yourself. You need somebody to help you. You can go to local companies, you can rent speakers at like Guitar Center. You can rent speakers at, uh, just pull up uh, AV equipment rental companies in your town, in your city. Uh, you can rent little PA systems. Now, some of these venues want you to use their in-house AV company. Like hotels, they really push it on there. So the question is, they rent you a screen and projector for $1,500. Well, why? Because they have to pay half the profits back, back to the hotel. So you can find outside AV companies in your town that will rent you a nice screen and a nice projector for a third of the cost. Uh, do some research, um, audio, video, and be sure to add a little bit of lighting to it. You know, you're, you're creating a brand, you're creating a look. Uh, if it looks like you just have a screen and projector in a little room, that's what they're gonna get out of it. But like you were saying, Jeff, that texture adds value from the screen standpoint, but start off small, operate within a budget, don't go over budget, and then just grow from there. But what will happen, what you're looking for is you're looking for what we call a true ROI. So let's say the event costs $1,500 to produce. How much return are you getting off of that ROI within 30 days? A good show should, re should net 35 to 42% ROI within 30 days. Because the majority of your momentum is gonna be in the first week or two of the activity. Because everybody feels energized when you leave. Have you ever been at an event? Like, I know San Diego, everybody was hanging around afterwards. Nobody wanted to leave. Well, you wanna capture that energy. But if you're worried about rolling up cables and you're worried about putting speakers away, you're not capturing that energy. So that's one of the things that I would start with, basically, that you start small, hire some, Believe it or not, they're teaching production now in high school. And if you're looking for a good way to go get some good talent, if you look at my technicians, the average age of my good technicians, 25, 27 years old, and they're young. I intentionally do not learn the new gear just because one, I don't have time, but two, I want to be with you, the client. And that's one of the things you gotta be able to hand the reins over and say, look, here's what I want and do a run through, do a rehearsal, you know, a few hours before, but hopefully that answered the question and talked to you how the watch would hurt on the yeah. basic one. Yeah, absolutely. At, at what point would you say, is it important for an agent or a brokerage or a team to, uh, to involve an actual AV company? At like what level, what number of people or what square footage of event uh, is it necessary in your opinion to, to, uh, to include an AV company? Well, one of the things you can always do, I don't care. This is what I tell my suspects or my prospects. One, I always tell them, send me an email, tell me what you're doing and let me give you some guidance. If it's something that's a project that I can take on or have one of my guys help you with, a project manager, then I'll direct you this way. But if, it's, if you don't have the budget for it, let me give you a little, I'll send them a few videos on what to do. Uh, but to get to the level like you're at, uh, what I would start with is, when you go into, a, if you're going to a hotel and you have to start talking attrition, royalties, uh, power, internet, you have to start negotiating things. A lot of these companies don't know the right questions to ask. Like for example, a lot of hotels will not tell you that you've got to pay for power until after you sign the contract. So your power in San Diego was a little over $3,500, okay? And that was negotiated, they did an incredible job on the front end. But a lot of clients, they'll come to me like, a client this morning just came to me. She goes, did you realize the hotel's charging me $5,000 for electricity? I go, did you read the contract? And she said, who reads those? I said, that's why you read those. So when you start getting into contracts, I tell my, my prospects, don't sign anything. Let us get eyes on it. It's like a real estate transaction. This is very similar to real estate. You have an offer, you have an acceptance. You have a contract that you write, then you have an initial back and forth. Then when you execute the contract, <clears throat> you have deposits that have to be paid and things that have to be done. 
But if you go into a venue that's going to make you sign a, a contract and you have to rent X amount of rooms and your power is going to be this, the same thing with internet. Um, they, they wanted, uh, there's some sort of, well, I had a client that they wanted one internet line at the Dallas Convention Center. We were doing their booth and they were going to live stream from their booth. The venue wanted $29,000 for one internet line. And guess what? They had already signed the contract, so there's no leverage. Another thing you want to look out for is union halls. So a lot of these big cities, Las Vegas, Chicago, San Francisco, they have what are called union halls. I had a client brought me a contract. He had already signed it at a venue in Las Vegas. And I looked at it. I said, I guess you realize you know this is a union hall. And he goes, what's that? I go, well, instead of $35 an hour for a technician, you're not paying for $135 an hour for a technician. He goes, they can't do that to us. I said, did you, did you read the contract? And there again, he said, no. Hmm. It ended up costing him about $60,000 more in labor when he could have negotiated a little bit more better on the front end. So when you get to that level, I always had a motto. And it's on the wall over there. You can't see it. It says, go with your gut. If you read a contract and you get a gut feeling, have them reach out to y'all. I mean, you guys have my number. Have them somebody reach out to, to someone that they trust that knows this. Uh, event planners are paid one of two ways. They are really good to use for, uh, to help you take that pressure away. One, they can either get paid from the venue or you can actually pay them a flat fee. So it's kind of like a real estate, a CMP designation, a certified meeting meeting professional. It's actually a designation, a license you get. They can get paid up to 10% from the venue for the entire bill, heads and beds and everything. So they can get a, a commission from the hotel for that which is good, you don't have to pay it. But the back side is, the flip side is this. If their job is to help you help them get the highest price out of you, they're always not gonna be on your conscious side to help save you the most money. So an extension cord, well, I'll use it for example. A basic extension cord like this. And a hotel to rent it is $35. When you go to Walmart and buy them for 10. So, what will happen is, is they're like, yeah, we need 10 extension cords and you won't get the bill to the end. So all the account executives at the venues, not just hotels, they're on a commission basis, just like in real estate. So the higher the bill, the bigger their commission. Now, if you hire an event planner and you pay them a flat fee, like X amount of dollars to help negotiate this, then their, their object is to help drive the cost down. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. <coughs> The, it's all about relationship. And when I say this is very similar to real estate, I mean, this is like, I listened to my wife's contract negotiations and they're almost mirrored to mine. In 2008, we did a lot of mortgage um, productions and that was right before the, the Lehman collapse of 08 and, and everything else. And um, so we, we it, it mirrors a lot of going back and forth with the venue, with the production company, with the client, but you need an advocate. You need someone to step in there for you and quote unquote, be the bad guy. It's just like in real estate. Your job as a realtor is to get the best representation for your client out there and to cover all of the gotchas. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Chris Eisman, if you saw the, the big short, the movie about the mm -hmm. guy that leveraged uh, the, the market during the collapse, well, we did a show with him in New York a few years ago and I'm micing him up and he wants two mics and he's got his Starbucks and he goes, they call me Turner on site. They go, Turner, they go, watch how many bankers get up and walk out of here when they announce my name. And we're in Times Square. We're at the Marquis Marriott. And I don't know, like, there's a ton of bankers. There's D Jamie Dimon. There's all these Wells Fargo guys and Chase guys, Pandit, and everybody's there. And of course, they introduced me as a keynote speaker. And as soon as he starts walking up on stage, about 30 of them stand up and walk out. Hmm. But I have a relationship with him because I've mic'd him up several shows and get to know him, but there's a trust factor there and I'm the bad guy. So if something goes out, I'm there. And I tell you that story, it's a trust factor. It, it truly is. My job is to make you look good. And they're going to come back to me if I do, just like in real estate, if you do a great job, they're not going anywhere else. They're your client for life. So, but yes. So, so like, a, I, I don't, not sure if you actually answered the question, but uh, what, what, at what point do you, would you say um, that, that, that somebody should employ this. Cause like I said, you know, we did an event for 300 people and the venue had AV equipment, but it was basic. It was bare bones stuff. But 
Um, and so to me, it was more about the content than it was the production. But at what, at what point or what have you seen? Uh, you know, you've been around the business a long time. You've done a lot of real estate events. So what kind of real estate events or what kind of small events have you seen where they actually did incorporate AV? So I would say there's one we did for a group of 100. And we've, uh, that was about six years ago. And now they've grown. They're up to over 3,500 now. So they brought me in. There was about 100 people in the room. And I told them, I said, see what the hotel is going to let you use. And like you said, they said the same thing. It's all about content. So I would say bring them in at the earliest level. So to answer your question in a short, in a short sentence, bring them in at any level, at the beginning level, uh, maybe not podcasting things you're doing out of your house, but if you're going to a venue, if you're going to somewhere where you got to sign a contract, go ahead and get a second opinion and see what you can do to bring in the extra gear. So for example, you spent, let's say you spent $5,000 in AV gear at the hotel in St. Louis. I don't know what you spent. But for that same $5,000, we could have added a whole lot of lighting. We could have added, did they give you recordings of the event? No. Yeah, did they give you any of that? And that's all the stuff you can do. And you work with a production company that one, owns their own gear. That's huge. Because if you're working with a broker, someone that calls themselves a production company that doesn't own their own gear, they can't control the relationship. They can't control the discount because they've got to now go somewhere else to get the gear and it's going to cost you more money. So I would say bring someone in as early as if you're going to a venue anywhere that you're having to sign a contract, I would say bring them in at that point and then let them grow with you and let them provide what we call the A1, the audio tech and the graphics tech. Um, we have a little show we do for a guy in San Antonio every year. There's probably 35 people in the room, but I've been doing it for 20 years. He's an investment broker, but he, he has a very niche market for uh, high net worth individuals. And he brings the stops out for this people. And he records everything and everybody, I mean, he does a great job, but it's 35 people in the room and he trusts us with it every year. We've been doing it for years. I mean, he's been doing it a long time. We've only been doing it probably 15, 20 years, but really nice guy. And I put the same two guys on it every year. So once you see that comfort level with them, this is what you're looking for. But I would say bring them in at any, at any level, you know, at any, at any mark. Okay, fair enough. And, and I think, and, and to recap what you said in the segment before that, which is, which is read the damn contracts. Because if exactly. you don't read the contract, there's a lot of hidden things. And this is part of the reason why we decided to do this webinar was because if you don't know what you're doing and you just go in and assume, oh, this is just your typical legal jargon, like you said, you're paying for power, power. Like, like to plug into to an electrical outlet, they're going to charge you for that. And that's how you will get taken at the most common, you know, venue, the most common venues, like, like a hotel or, or like you said, like a union hall. So it just all depends on where you're doing the events. They will, but they will capitalize on your weakness at every opportunity. And that's the way we put it is they're going to capitalize on it because you got nowhere else to go. You're there. You need it. They have it. And I can tell you story after story, a client called me and I asked him three times, do you want pipe and drape behind the stage? It'll look good, you know, trust me. And they're like, no, 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 we don't, we don't want it. I'm like, okay, well, I get the hotel and the hotel charged them $18 a foot and they needed a bunch of it. And I was like trying to get them on the front end. I'm like, oh, don't tell the hotel you need it yet because you've already, you know, committed to it. So if you do find yourself in that position, this is what you do. Well, let's say you're at an event and you've got people already showing up and you're going to need either more PA or you're going to need more screens or more drape. <clears throat> Ask the hotel to give you an estimate before you sign. They're called BEOs, banquet event orders. Um, banquet you sign, event orders. They're called BEOs, yeah, at a hotel. So the banquet is department is what it is in charge of. But ask them to give you a quote and you can still negotiate with them. Now, another thing that I do on the front end, uh, when I come on site for the first time to a venue that I haven't uh, worked in before, I find the hotel is going to assign you with what's called an SOD, a supervisor on duty, to watch your production crew load in and load out. I go to that person, and the first thing I do is I tip them in advance. I say, look, this is for a great show. Let me know if we can do anything to help because he's looking at it as, hey, you're taking business from the hotel. But now he's got a tip going, hey, thank you very much. And I've had people come to me going, hey, you know, do you need anything else? And it really, it really takes the pressure off right away. I tip on the front and I tip on the back. It doesn't have to be much. 
depending on this. I mean, it could be 20 bucks. It could be just the thought of it. I mean, but you take care of the, the, the people because those are the ones that are down in the dirt that are doing the working. Um, another thing you want to be aware of, ask the venue if they are going to charge you for any what's called CAD drawings or vector works drawings. So in the last three years, there's a bit a big push on safety. We're familiar with all the shootings that's been going on. Uh, believe it or not, venues have active, active shooter drills and guidelines now. They've got fire guidelines. They've got medical guidelines. They've got evacuation routes. There's a lot of things behind the scenes now, but the, t the flip side to that is they all now require CAD drawings for the, your event. So and the fire marshal has to approve them. So a lot of clients don't know that there's a charge for that. So be sure to ask the venue, hey, do you require any CAD drawings for your fire marshal? So show last week in Las Vegas, I asked them for their, for their drawings and they hadn't done them yet. And I'm like, guys, the city of Las Vegas fire department, if, you, if this is less than 30 days out for the amount of people that you are gonna be hosting, the certificate of occupancy fee was $1,100. And I told the client, I said, look, why didn't the hotel tell you this? And they're like, I don't know. So they went and got the hotel rep. They're like, do we need to get a certificate of inspection? She goes, you sure do. And she goes, if we do it for you, it's 2,500 bucks. And I stopped them right there. I go, look, do you have the drawing? And they said, yeah. So I said, give me a print of the drawing. I took the client, we drove to the fire station and we saved them $1,400 within 30 minutes. And that will forever seal that deal. <coughs> but it's another weakness that they were trying to capitalize on, but be sure to ask them if they have any CAD drawings that have to be approved by the fire marshal. And if you have to have certificate of occupancy for every room that you have people in. And if you do it in advance, it's like $50 a room. But if you wait to the last minute and you've got to put a rush order on it, they're going to, they're going to tag you pretty hard for it. And another, another thing too, that I just thought of that happened to us in San Diego was the, uh, they will, what do they call like a stinger, inside yep. the room to to lessen your wi-fi um to minimize it explain explain what happened there and what somebody could look out for in that in that so you really want to look out for um hotels that really push their internet because you know it's at a premium um so to say this without throwing anybody under the bus and saying this is so they have their devices out there that kills or reduces the signal from what we call our frequency your cell phones they reduce signals in certain areas, movie theaters. Um, you may not get four bars, you may just get one. There's devices out there. We all know they're out there, out there. but some venues, and I'm not saying it was that hotel, uh, some hotels will turn them on and off because they want you to buy their internet or some venues. So for example, we had a bunch of people in a room and the day before the Wi-Fi was, or the, the signal was just fine. But when the show started the next day, the signal was horrible. And they're like, well, there's so many people in the room. I go, yeah, but there's nobody on their, on their phones. The signal strength is still the same, but it's the bandwidth. <clears throat> but you go two rooms over, it's just fine. So what happens is you've got to be very cognitive of uh, certain venues in certain areas with that, it's called a stingray. And I'm not accusing anybody because it's, that's illegal. That's a big, that's a big no, no, but it just, it's interesting to see how one one day is fine and the next day it's not. There's a lot of things behind the scenes that it's like pulling the veil back um, that we learn in production. We get to learn the truth very quickly about different things. And that's one of the things, but most of the people are on, they're on good terms. They know uh, one of the things you can buy, and this is not a, this is not a, there's nothing, there's a thing called a cradle point. And it's a big industrial router. Um, I don't have it up there, but it's usually behind me. It's about this big, like $1,500, $2,000. But you can put an MDM SIM card in it. And it's the same device that they have in police and fire and ambulance. And it'll hold four or 500 people on that router. It's, it'll do 600 up and 600 down. And then you pay for it that way. And it's high speed. And it'll work in, I'm going to say, 80 to 90% of all the venues that we've been in. And you can own it. There's no reason that you can't use it in your own, in your own. If you're live streaming or if you're attendees to have Wi-Fi or things of that nature, that may be something you want to look at investing in. But that's a, that's a item that we provide for our clients.
Awesome. That's good stuff. So, and, and I think you mentioned this at the beginning. Uh, one other thing that I think is important to bring up is that a lot of people play music at their events. Like you'll just plug in your phone or you'll have the radio or whatever it is. Um, and that's a no, no. I mean, you can't just arbitrarily play whatever music you want. Right. So the way, the way, and you want to get an IP attorney, we have a very good one here at Nomad, intellectual property attorney. And uh, the way, it, the way the law reads that I interpret it, is if you're charging someone to come to your event, let's say you're charging them $100, <clears throat> so you're charging an admission fee, and you pay, play a copyrighted um, song, say Bruno Mars. Well, Bruno Mars is entitled to his royalty for that song that you're playing. Uh, another example, right now there's a big clip out there, The Greatest Showman, it's like a three-minute clip. and We were on a show site in Vegas the other day, and I asked her, uh, the the speaker wanted to play the three minute clip. I said, look, that's fine. I don't assume anything. If anything happens, we're not responsible for it. But that clip you want to play for this amount of people is going to cost you about $1,500. I said, if you get on the phone with BMI right now or ASCAP or CSAC and you get that royalty, you'll be fine. But I'm telling you, we're not assuming any responsibility whatsoever because they were, they were pushing everything out. And where they catch you is social media. All the hashtags, all the recordings. And sure enough, she played the three minute clip and it hit Facebook, you know, really big. She was on stage and it was for another, it was a network marketing company. And about a week later, I get a call from her wanting to know if she could have the name of our attorney. I go, why? What's up? She goes, well, I got an email from ASCAP wanting to know if I had royalties to this song or this, this, this clip. And I said, she goes, how do you think they found out? I said, how many likes did you have on your Facebook? <laughs> she goes, 3,000. I said, you didn't think they were going to find out? I said, Facebook will immediately report it they'll, or they'll take it down if they don't report it. And sure enough, it ended up costing her a whole lot more money and she had to pay for it after the fact. So, so what should somebody do? So in so that case, if you follow- it boils down, bottom, bottom dollar, it boils down to about 21 cents a head for an event. So if you've got 1,000 people in an event, it's 200 bucks. But if there's something copyrighted that's on your playlist that you know it's in your presentation, now there's a 10 second grace. So if you just play 10 seconds of it, of a clip, they'll let you do that, but it can't be more than 10 seconds. So if you have a GIF or something that's 10 seconds, fine, you'll, you'll probably get by with that. But these guys that are putting these one, two, three, four, five minute clips in their presentations or in their music, you know, they're bumping on and off. Uh, it's not if, but when we've had several clients, but now we have an entire department set up for that. But how you do it is I'll give you the information through ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, and you can register your event. It's like 150 bucks a year, $137 a year for you to have your license. And then you just have to send in a list of the songs that you're playing. And it's basically 21 cents a head. Now, if there's a song that you're playing, let's say it's, I don't know, let's say it's a high profile song and it's going to cost you more money. You may want to get, a quote on what it's going to cost before you play it. You may want to have a, a different, uh, Lee Greenwood, what's the song that God bless the USA? That's about an $8,000 royalty if you have more than 10,000 people in the room. So every song has a different price point, but if you're under events under a thousand, you're looking at about 21 cents a head. And once you pay it, you're done and you're on good terms. You can also do this. You can now use it on social media. So what happens with Facebook and Instagram and everything else? If you have a copyrighted material that you want to try to brand a listing with or whatever else, you can now put in your um, ASCAP membership ID. You can give it to them and they will send them the amount of views and you just pay for it as the views click. So it's not, it's going to, it's going to save you a lot of money and it's done properly. Do people do it all the time without it? Yeah. Did they get taken down? Yeah. Did they get in trouble? Yeah. But it's, there's a right way to do it. It's like, you know, getting a full commission on a real estate transaction, but there's a right way. And I'll send you all the, the information. You can Google it. It's ASCAP, BMI, and CSAT. Uh, two are out of Nashville. One are at, one's out of New York, I believe. But, right. Uh, maybe, maybe put them in the comments uh, after, yeah. after we're off here. Um, I and, and I think it's important to say as well, because a lot of the people that are on lab code agents, uh, there's plenty of people that do speaking engagements and create PowerPoint presentations or Prezi presentations. And that's what he's talking about here too. This is not just the event, but actually the presenter as well. So if you have clips, if you're, if you're putting in these clips or you're putting in music and it's longer than 10 seconds, 
uh, you might want to cover your backside depending on the, you know, how big the venue is or how big the audience is as to whether or not it could get out there. Um, I'm guessing the odds are very slim, but like you said, it's happened before. So the bigger, uh, better, the, better bigger the audience, the more likelihood of it happening. Uh, another thing I want to, I want to touch on and a lot of people aren't familiar with it are the labor laws. So what happens is, is people get real excited about the event and y'all are really good with your timeline in San Diego. You guys had it to a T in fact, y'all ended early, which is great, but they have what's called the fair labor standards act and went into effect a few years ago. <clears throat> what happened was you, you heard in the old days, all the roadies would work, you know, 20 hours straight. They'd load in the show, do the show, then load out the show. And you know, they get 200 bucks for the day or $300 for the day. Well, about five or six years ago, a lot of these guys banded together, went and hired an attorney and said, Hey, look, they're working us 20 hours a day and we're not getting any overtime. They're working us to death. If you, if you break it down, we're getting $200. We're making $10 an hour. We're making $5 an hour. So now the Fair Labor Standards Act says when it comes to production, this is some of the stuff we put in the notes, um, anything over 10 hours in a work day that you hire someone for, you've got to offer them, offer them as the keyword, the ability to make overtime. Okay. So, or you've got to bring in a second shift to cover their shift. So we have a show coming up it's, um, here in Dallas. And we load in at 6 a.m. The show plays at 7 p.m. And then we're done at midnight. So if we start at 6 a.m. at 4 p.m., they go on overtime. And the technicians and the, and the, and the staff, they have to either have to have an eight-hour break in between shifts. On a 10-hour shift, they have to have an eight-hour break. Or there's some guidelines in there. Um, so what happens is, is you, need to, you need to be prepared for that on the front end is what I'm saying. If the hotel is going to punish you by not using their in-house AV, saying, look, your, your event starts at 5 p.m. Well, you don't have access to the room until 6 a.m. the morning of. Sorry, you didn't use our in-house AV, so you're going to be punished now. So before you sign a contract, you need to make sure you know what times you have access to the room to set up. More than likely, the room will be empty at midnight or at 10 p.m. the night before. So have them come in at 10 p.m., work for four hours, go get some rest, come back. Uh, don't let the hotel use that as leverage against you uh, to hurt you in overtime. And I, and I see it all the time. So the first thing we do is we establish our timeline before we negotiate our hotel contract or our venue contract. But you've got to offer the, the Fair Labor Standard Act to the employees. Now, another thing that you can work off of is volunteers. So believe it or not, if you're working, we have a real estate company that, that is a big sponsor for the Boys and Girls Club here in Dallas. They put on a big gala every year. And this is their outreach for the gala. This is how they, you know, they're, they're out there helping set up for it. And it's a big real estate company here locally. So what happens is, is they go and they get volunteers and they market this to their past clients and, hey, look, we're doing an outreach for the Boys and Girls Club. We're looking for some teenage people to help push road cases and do this. We're going to feed them. We're going to give you free tickets to the concert that night. We're bringing in whoever they brought in um, uh, some artists last year. They give them free tickets and they feed them and they make a whole event out of it. And they get a lot, a lot of FaceTime. Their logos are everywhere and the volunteers and their labor bill is a minimum. So that's an idea as well, but you got to make sure your timelines are very well established and make sure the hotel, so I go to the client when the two hours before the, the technician is about to go on overtime, I'm on the book. In two hours, they go on overtime. How much longer do you think you're gonna be so I can bring in somebody else or is over a little bit of overtime okay? And we give the end client the opportunity to mitigate that cost, so to speak. But the labor, so here's what happened back to the original story, is they put in a whistleblower clause. So if I find out, Jeff, that you're not paying overtime, and I go report you to the Department of Labor, guess what? I get a really nice finder fee to turn you in. So a lot of these little hotels and a lot of these things in Vegas and union hotels, they got watchdogs out there that are making sure. So on a union contract, if I don't give you a lunch break after five hours, it's called a meal penalty. They charge you triple time for that hour. So if you're coming up on meal penalty and you don't get a one hour walk away break, I got to feed you. So we always take care of them. But once again, I say it's all about relationships. So we've been fortunate to, to do shows all around the world. And we have relationships from Mexico to Australia, 
to the UK. And so the guys, if you treat your people right, they want to stay with you. And it, there it goes back to tipping on the front side, developing that relationship. You look at my network of stagehands, I can hit a button and 50 people say, I want to work with you guys. So, but the labor is the big thing. But you guys, you guys are dialed in. Congratulations on your success, first of all. It's just, I've done some research and I've, and you guys have it dialed in really, really nice. And I love the fact that it's all about education. And that's what makes the whole thing roll. And the class that you guys presented in San Diego, when people would try to come up and like, why are you here? Why are you there? The way that Nick handled that and Tristan and you are like, hey, we're not here to talk about that today. We're here about education. You don't see that. And I, and I get to see a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And there's no animosity. There's no friction. You guys are all going the same direction. So once again, congratulations on your success. And, and we're so excited about to get to work with you. Thank you. So and I think, I think to, to summarize what we've talked about today, which is a lot of deep in the weed stuff that you don't think about. I know we didn't. Um, and that's why we are, have since that we're working with a company like Nomad Productions. And I think if you're thinking about doing any kind of event of any size at any venue that might take advantage of you, uh, let, let, me just, let me just make it very simple for you you need to have a contact, uh, whether it is Doug with Nomad or it's an AV company that's local, uh, you need to have a contact because you may not have known about labor laws. You may not know even what the hell ASCAP is. You may not know about um, not having to pay for, uh, for, for electric, or you may not know that they can, uh, can, they can minimize the, the Wi-Fi signal in the room. And those are the things that I think are very important that we wanted to share today. So Doug, I appreciate you being on and hopefully, yeah. Hopefully there's, there's some people out there that are doing events. And if you, if you, you know, here's the other thing is this is a plug for Doug is, you know, again, we've chosen who, who to work with because we've done enough events now and uh, we want to work with somebody who has our back and, and you should too. So um, obviously, and if you have anything to add, Doug, obviously make, make sure if anybody has any questions, engage the comments, yeah. add it to the comments below. And uh, we really appreciate you being on today. Well, I appreciate you guys, Jeff. And I'll, I'll just say this in closing. Like I said, you guys are doing things the right way, but at the same time, the relationship, the, the trust factor is, now you can pick up the phone, Jeff, and you can say, hey, we have an event in Michigan, and the conversation's over. You know what to expect when you get there. You're not having to micromanage every little detail. The first event, I always had a little bit of heartburn. <clears throat> but after that, you're like, all right, when's the next, you know, what's next? So that level of expectation, it takes, it frees up you time, your time to do what you do best. And, you know, thanks again for all the, the kudos and everything else. We're excited to work with you guys. I know we'll see a lot of you guys in Michigan. I know we got some stuff coming up in Dallas. We got some stuff we're working on in D.C. Uh, we've got some, a lot of great stuff. So but thanks again for having me on and having the Nomad team on. And I'll, I'll, I'll wear my hat with pride here. <laughs> we appreciate it. We appreciate it. So for those of you who are still here, here with us, we'll be in Detroit on uh, September 16th. Uh, Doug's crew will be there. So obviously, if you want to get, get introduced to them there, you're welcome to. But we'll be there. We'll be putting on another uh, LCA1 event with, with the AV team. And we're looking forward to uh, bringing a bunch of value and educating like we always do. So, Doug, again, thank you for being on today. Thank you for sharing. Uh, this is very kind of you, and uh, we appreciate you. Thank you, man. All right, man. Take care. Thank okay. you guys for being on today. Thanks, guys.